it's really important to think about the order in which you approach LSAT logical reasoning questions. They're bite-sized, independent from each other, in contrast to games and reading comp. Now, the benefit is that the stakes are lower for each question because your understanding of one question does not help or hinder your performance on a future question. You don't, they don't relate to each other, except they sometimes do relate to each other. And that happens when you got bogged down on a tough question, maybe it's number 19 or 20 in the section, and you decided, you know what, you're not, it's not clicking, you're investing minute after minute, and you're not getting anything out of it, so you want to skip it and move on. But you can't let go of it because you're so worried about how the LSAT is going for you, and you start to stress out when you think everything's riding on this one question, and there was that game in the previous section, and you haven't had reading comp yet, so you're worried about how that's going to go. And it ends up bringing your entire performance down. So what you want to do is get good at letting go of the tough questions that risk bogging you down, getting you stuck in a kind of LSAT quicksand, flagging them so that you can come back to them later. This is actually one of the cool features of the digital LSAT is that you will be able to flag LSAT questions and at a glance, see exactly which ones you flagged to potentially go back to later. Now you might be asking, how do you know you'll be able to go back later? Well, it's pacing, it's something to practice. If you're aiming for 160 or 165 plus reasonably, I would suggest that you consider doing the first 10 questions in about 10 to 12 minutes. That way you build up a time bank that you can apply to tougher questions later in the section. My goal for you is that you do maybe three to five questions, you flag them, you do them at the end. So maybe you finish the section at the 30 minute mark or the 32 minute mark, giving you three to five minutes to spare. And then you can go back and tackle those tough ones. And it might sound crazy, but this it happens to everybody where they face tough questions. The key is having the mindfulness and the focus, the self-control to force yourself to let go of that question and come back to it later. Personally, I'll flag three to five questions to come back to later. I still do that now, and I'm scoring a 175. That was my official LSAT score. So my advice to you then is don't worry about the tough ones, the parallel reasoning questions that appear late in the section, the formal logic-y type questions with the abstract language. That's okay. Maybe science, if that's not your thing, it's all fine. Skip, flag them, skip them for now, come back to them at the end, when you've already picked off what may be lower hanging fruit. LSAT logical reasoning has a general order of difficulty, not a perfect order of difficulty. So it's possible that you're getting bogged down on questions 20 to 22, when questions 24 and 25 might actually be easier. Now, how do you get those formal logic questions with tough abstract language? How do you make them easier for yourself? One thing you can do is you can drill them in isolation. You could go through a couple dozen questions, maybe even 50 questions that contain this abstract formal language and define all those words and phrases for yourself. Actually set aside a couple hours and look up definitions for those words and phrases. Things like antecedent and consequent, things like an ad hominem personal attack. Anytime you see a concept where you don't understand their description of it, it's worth looking it up because there's a decent chance that you actually do understand the concept, but it's how they're describing it that confuses you. And because those questions only appear every so often, a lot of students never actually end up learning what they need to learn to better solve them in the future. And too many students all often focus on the right answer rather than the wrong answers. So it can actually be really valuable for you to define all of the answer choices, right and wrong, because what was a wrong answer in one question may be a right answer in a future question. So that's an exercise that you can work on. It's helped my students a great deal, and I think you'll find it useful as well if this is something you struggle with. Another thing we can talk about is common LSAT mistakes. There are many, many mistakes I could talk about. One that stands out as being particularly noteworthy and common is confusing necessary and sufficient assumption questions. A lot of people do questions by type, but they'll do assumption questions all lumped together because that's how some companies categorize them. 
And this is really important to know the difference between necessary assumption questions and sufficient assumption questions because they're asking for very different things. It's incredibly important to view them from the proper perspective. Necessary assumption questions are not a strength in type as many people believe. In fact, they are a very specific kind of must be true question. We know that they must be true because it says necessary in the name of the question. They're looking for something that the argument depends upon, the argument requires, and the argument assumes. And the LSAT actually uses those exact phrases in the question stem to help you ID this question type. And I'll prove it to you right now. So let's say we have an argument that God created the world. Let's just say that was an argument. Inherent in that argument, a given assumption is that if God created the world, then we know, we can infer, we can assume that there is or was a God at some point if we take that initial argument as given. This should not be viewed as new information we are imposing from outside. It is central to the argument. On the flip side, we have sufficient assumption questions and we can identify those because they use words and phrases in the question stem that are synonymous with sufficiency. Words like allows or enables or follows logically if assumed or properly inferred if assumed. These are all words and phrases that are synonymous with sufficiency. An example of this would be if we have the argument, I bought a $1 item, then it would be sufficient if we learned that you have a $100 bill that you used to make a purchase. Or let's say you want to buy a $1 item. It is sufficient to have $100 in order to buy a $1 item. It is not necessary to buy a $1 item, but it is sufficient to buy a $1 item. So big difference there. Having the value of a penny is necessary to buy a $1 item, but it's not sufficient, while the $100 is sufficient but not necessary. And of course, a stopped clock is right twice a day, so meaning you can occasionally get lucky if you confuse the two, because having $1 is both necessary and sufficient to buy a $1 item, but they'll rarely do that. And in fact, it'll be really difficult sometimes when you're viewing a question from the wrong perspective, because one of LSAC's favorite tricks is to include a sufficient assumption as a wrong answer choice when they're asking you for a necessary assumption question. I'm friends with a former writer of actual LSAT questions. You know, the, it's funny, the people you meet working in this industry. And we talked a little while ago about the fact that there are common tricks or traps LSAC uses in order to lure students into confidently choosing wrong answer choices. And this is one of many of them. And when it comes to your review process, there may be a thousand tricks the LSAT is testing, and you're not falling for all of them, or else you'd be getting a 120, which I'm guessing you're not, most likely. So there could be a thousand tricks they test, and maybe you fall for a hundred of them. Your job then is to figure out which hundred you're falling for, save a running list of those errors, or like a, maybe a binder of questions you've gotten wrong over the period you've been studying, and you can return to it again and again. You can use a photocopier or a PDF and reprint or recopy multiple copies of those exams, those questions, so that you can reattempt them with a fresh perspective. Like I said, going back to a tough question during a time section can give you a fresh perspective. The same is true of redoing questions. There is enormous value of redoing and redoing questions. And there are nearly 100 released exams at this point, 86 that are numbered and several that are unnumbered. And so, of course, you could do plenty of exams with it without ever doing the same question twice. But if you're a gunner type, someone who loves to challenge themselves and you reach the end and you want to do more, yeah, redo them. Totally fine. Just look for patterns in your mistakes. Specifically, what is tempting about a wrong answer choice that makes you pick it? What ultimately makes it wrong? And what is discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it? And what ultimately makes it correct? There are these traps of encouragement towards wrong answer choices and traps of discouragement towards right answer choices. And you want to over time, or really, I guess I should say traps of discouragement away from right answer choices. And so you want to spot exactly which traps you personally are falling for so that you don't make the same mistake again. 
you could actually study with nothing more than, let's say, 10 exams total out of the nearly 100 that have been released and just do those exams again and again. And that would be sufficient to help you figure out what is holding you back and to learn the exam in sufficient depth. Anyway, that's all for now. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please subscribe to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. I love hearing from students. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care. Before I go though, I do want to share a couple of free resources that I'd like to point in your direction. If you go to my website, the LSAT blog, on the homepage, there's a link to download a free, easy LSAT cheat sheet. It's my gift to you. And the cool thing about it is that it contains a general one-page overview of the LSAT, along with links inside the PDF to various resources on related LSAT question types and LSAT sections, LSAT concepts. And so if you're looking for a free download that will help you out on all aspects of your prep, please do feel free to check that out. You can go right now on your computer, on your phone, just Google LSAT blog, you hit the homepage, click the link, you'll be good to go. And again, please again, feel free to reach out if you need anything at all. I'm happy to help however I can. Take care. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.